Assalamu alaikum. This is Dr. Marim Abdullah, and this talk is going to be about um, the role of the general dental practitioner in uh, orthodontic treatment and uh, how to handle emergencies in orthodontics. Our references um, are going to be the, um, this uh, guide. Uh, from the British Orthodontic Society, 2010, Managing the Developing Occlusion, and Chapter 25 from uh, Simon Littlewood and Laura Mitchell, uh, An Introduction to Orthodontics. Also, these two articles from Dental Update 2015, Part 1 and Part 2 related to emergencies in orthodontics. So, the general dental practitioner rule in orthodontics uh, is extremely important to understand and apply. The dentist should be able to examine the patient and diagnose the, the malocclusion and to do so they should have a proper amount of knowledge in terms of normal development of the occlusion, craniofacial uh, and craniofacial structures in addition to proper knowledge and skills for extraoral and intraoral orthodontic examination. They should be able to describe the malocclusion and communicate to the patient about this issue and give advice on the recommended orthodontic treatment and the proper timing. If possible, the dentist should be able to carry out interceptive or simple orthodontic treatment or refer for orthodontic treatment at the optimal time. And this is what we call the, uh, the interceptive orthodontic treatment or referral early uh, for a proper timing. And finally, the dentist should be able to manage orthodontic emergencies. So to uh, go through this, it's important to know how to write a proper referral letter for advice or for um, actual, uh, actual referrals to carry out the proper treatment by the specialist. Now, the referral letter should include a first uh, area of uh, the address of the dentist and the address of the uh, specialist orthodontist. Of course, patient's demographics, basic information, reason for referral, uh, features of patient's malocclusion, and this is what we call the summary. And now, uh, and we will talk about how to write a summary properly. And of course, history of any previous uh, treatment, uh, any recent or relevant radiographs or records, maybe photographs, um, uh, that should be uh, also attached to the letter. The case summary should include these informations. You just need to fill in blanks. So this should include the patient's name, age, chief complaint. So instead of writing name, age, etc. Uh, per se, this is what you go. You go for like, for example, Ahmad, 12 years old, chief complaint is, and you continue. So this is just to give you keywords, but actually you replace these with the proper uh, words describing your patient. Uh, medical and dental history, um, IR means if relevant, so you don't have to go and say if it's unhealthy um, for every patient, it depends if it's relevant, or if they have a relevant medical condition or dental condition, then you mention it. You need to mention the developmental stage, for example, permanent dentition, mixed dentition, early mixed dentition, deciduous dentition, uh, etc. Incisors classification, as you all learned, class one or class two division one, class two division two or class three. A skeletal classification, the anterior posterior dimension, and then vertical, and then transverse, and the need to mention something about soft tissue if relevant. Oral, and and this is the end of the uh, let's say first first part of the examination, and then we move into orally into oral and dental health. Uh, again, if relevant, alignment of lower arch, then upper arch, um, if relevant, over jet, over bite, canine and molar relationships, center lines, and cross bite. 
just to give you an example, so this is AJ, 13 years old. Uh, his chief complaint is an incisor behind the bite with spaced upper labial segment. Fit and healthy, brush once a day with good oral hygiene. This is his intraoral, as you could see. This, the, this is a patient who presented in the permanent dentition. <coughs> and these are his radiographs. So this is how it goes. This is the uh, draft and the guideline for the summary and we just fill in blanks so we would say AJ is 13 years old male who doesn't like his upper right lateral being behind the bite that's it this is his chief complaint and then we continue he is in the permanent dentition with a class 1 incisors classification on a class 1 skeletal pace average vertical proportions and competent lips complicated by anterior cross bite on the upper right lateral full stop so as you could see, these keywords should guide you into a proper and a meaningful uh, sentences and a meaningful paragraph. So it doesn't go like it doesn't go like um, the bullet points. No, it, you, you're writing a letter or you're writing a summary, a summarizing paragraph. So you should write proper sentences. Uh, to continue. He presents with mild crowding in the upper and lower labial segments, average overjet, deep overbite, class 1 molar relationship bilaterally, with half unit class 2 canine relationship on the right and class 1 on the left. Full stop. Lower center line shifted to the right 2 mm. And that's it. So this is the summary. If you're writing a referral letter, then basically this should be preceded by greeting to the uh, orthodontist that you want to refer to and of course before that their address date and your address etc you know the, the basic uh, format of uh, a proper referral letter and then you say that this patient came to visit me on whatever date um, and then you specify what records you've taken and then you write this paragraph of summary this summary should be uh, followed by uh, a paragraph describing why you're writing this letter. So you would say that, for example, I'm referring this patient to your care to carry out any necessary treatment, full stop. So you did the diagnosis and you think that the orthodontist should do the treatment, for example. Or you might go and say, I'm planning to fit a removable appliance with whatever active components that you're planning to use, for example, here, upper uh, right, the Z spring on the upper right lateral incisor, maybe buccal canine retractor on the upper right canine, uh, and you just try summary of the design and you would refer this patient for advice so that the orthodontist would read the letter, see the patient, examine them, and maybe um, confirm your treatment plan and your uh, appliance design or modify the design accordingly according to his experience and according to the case. Uh, so again, the referral letter could be for uh, just advice of what you're planning to do, an approval of, uh, of your plan and your management, or the actual referral for a proper treatment by the uh, specialist himself or herself. During the deciduous dentition, it's rarely uh, necessary to go for a referral to the orthodontist. Usually you just go with uh, a usual examination, but if the patient is presented with um, any craniofacial syndromes or anomalies or cleft lip and palate or severe uh, maxillary or mandibular disproportions, severe skeletal problem, then it, it's important to refer the patient early in the deciduous dentition to the orthodontist. Uh, actually, this will need not only the orthodontist uh, a, a teamwork of other specialists, specialists to work with this patient, but anyway, an early referral is necessary to uh, start at least with an early documentation of the case records and um, uh, let's say uh, uh, planning uh, a proper uh, treatment uh, as early as possible. Now, in terms of um, mixed dentition, in the mixed dentition, um, there are a variety of problems that could be actually treated, and this is uh, covered in details in the two lectures on interceptive orthodontics that you actually took at the end of your fourth year. 
and I would recommend that you go and review it. We're going to summarize it here really quickly. Um, uh, for example, in the next dentition, the patient is presented with anterior or posterior crossbite with the mandibular displacement. Class 3, malocclusion in the mixed dentition. Class 2, malocclusion where you have a skeletal uh, class 2 pattern uh, and functional appliance is appropriate, then this is something to do in the mixed dentition. Um, asymmetric eruption of teeth. Uh, we know um, that uh, contralateral tooth could erupt within six, to, uh, within six months plus minus. And if any delay, then you might go uh, for a proper uh, diagnosis and maybe uh, proper management. Uh, severely hypoplastic or carious, uh, carious first uh, molars of poor long-term prognosis. This is extremely important and extremely relevant to you as general dental practitioner because you could do something early to benefit the patient. Um, lack of uh, palpable canine bulges, of course. We need to uh, feel the, ca the canine bulge buccally between 8 to 10. If, if it doesn't show up to 10 or if it's asymmetrical, then it's important to go for further uh, management. Hypodontia, missing teeth, supernumerary teeth also needs early diagnosis and management. Submerged deciduous molars or impacted first permanent molars. Um, or sometimes it is called ectopic eruption, periodontal problems caused by severely ectopic tooth position, severe crowding of incisors. In the permanent dentition, this is not um, called an interceptive treatment anymore. Usually in the permanent dentition, this is the proper time for the majority of the malocclusions uh, to go for um, comprehensive orthodontic treatment. So, of course, all malocclusions could be referred to the orthodontist at that stage. Now, going back to cases that could be selected for the general dental practitioner. These are the main cases. We're going to go through them as quickly as possible. But ideally, the general dental practitioner should have the knowledge and the skills to be able to carry out all these treatments. If in doubt, or if there is more complications, more um, uh, complex cases, then of course, of course, refer to the orthodontist at proper time, at the optimal time to carry out the necessary treatment. So anterior crossbite could range from a single anterior tooth to the whole anterior segment. Usually we could use simple removable appliances. We could use fixed appliances. And if you use removable appliances, we could go for Z-Springs for a single tooth, 0.5 mm stand seal wire as an active component, or two adjacent teeth, we use double cantilever, 0.6 mm stand seal wire, or if it's more than two teeth, then it's better to use an anterior expansion screw for the whole anterior segment. After correction, no retention is required only if the overbite is average or deep, Otherwise, you go for the same appliance, nighttime only, passive, just to maintain the corrected uh, anterior crossbite. And of course, uh, you need to keep the patient under the usual observations if it's every six months. Of course, the more teeth associated in the anterior crossbite, the more consequences of no treatment. So it's important to manage the patient. Uh, if that case requires fixed appliance, then it's important to refer the patient uh, to the orthodontist. This is an example of a patient who presented in the mixed dentition with lots of issues, but most importantly, this upper left central incisor and crossbite. So this needs urgent treatment. This needs interceptive treatment. So uh, we keep an eye on all other things going on, but here we need to decide on going for removal of lines. This spring, we just push the tooth across the bite and that's it. Because we have positive overbite, no need for retention, but we keep the patient under review every six months to make sure that the development of the occlusion from the mixed dentition to the permanent dentition is going smoothly without any further problems. This is a patient with more teeth in crossbite, so we go with an anterior expansion screw to correct this crossbite. So to class 3, 
it's extremely important to be able to identify and differentiate pseudoclast 3 from the real actual uh, class 3 malocclusion. Pseudoclast 3 is when the patient is having an anterior cross bite, but they're able to bite their incisors edge to edge. So they bite edge to edge, which is a premature contact, and they and then they go into anterior mandibular displacement, which is more comfortable occlusion to avoid the premature contact. So if the patient is able to go edge to edge, and there is no family history of a class three malocclusion and big mandibles, and the overbite is positive, average or deep, then this is an excellent case to go for an early interceptive treatment with a quite good success rate. Uh, if this is not the case, then it's extremely important to go for a proper referral to the orthodontist to go for further diagnosis and management. So this is an example of a beautiful young lady who's having an anterior cross bite, but this is the magic. This is where you have the patients being able to go edge to edge. So she's having anterior cross bite, average overbite, etc., etc., all the other things going on. But when you ask the patient to bite edge to edge, she's, she's capable to do so. She's having this straight profile with the class 3 ish skeletal pattern, no family history of orthodontic treatment. So immediately we go for uh, anterior expansion screw because we have more than two teeth involved in the cross bite. We correct it in no time, and you could actually see her profile going relaxed into a beautiful class 1 pattern. So we didn't do anything in terms of growth, but what we did was to correct the anterior cross bite and eliminate anterior mandibular displacement by doing so. So the key is to be able to identify those cases. Posterior cross bite, if a single tooth is in a posterior cross bite, then it's easy, you can go for a T-spring if you have enough space for the tooth to be pushed buckly. A unilateral buckle cross bite with mandibular displacement, again, this is an important feature to be corrected as early as possible because this is a functional need. And usually we go for, if in the uh, deciduous dentition or early mixed dentition, we can go for selective grinding of the uh, deciduous canines usually, or identify the premature occlusal contacts and go for proper trimming, or we could use uh, removable appliance with midline expansion screw to, uh, to, to uh, eliminate this uh, uh, occlusal interference and uh, eliminate mandibular displacement. If you have unilateral buccal cross bite without mandibular displacement, or if you have bilateral buccal cross bite or lingual cross bite, then it's important to refer to the orthodontist. This will need more. Uh, complicated uh, um, uh, treatment, so they, they will need proper uh, diagnosis and management by the orthodontist. After correction of the cross bite, it's important to consider retention, and the retention will depend on how much proper intercuspation you have. Um, the more the maximum intercuspation and proper interdigitation, the less retention you will need, and, and the more stable the result will be. Uh, this is a patient with cross bite on the five, of course, the lateral as well. There is enough space to accommodate the five and pushing uh, this to buckly. So this is what you go for. You go for T-spring and Z-spring and other retentive components, and you just push the two across the bite to correct the buckle cross bite. The patient with unilateral cross bite on the left side with mandibular displacement, this is a case that the general dental practitioner should be able to identify and should be able to manage as early as possible. And usually you go with a, an upper removal appliance with midline expansion screw, with the sewer bite planes as well. And you keep on expanding until the patient uh, gets a corrected uh, cross bite and you eliminate mandibular displacement. If this is the case, you just remove the posterior bite planes and you keep the same appliance nighttime only for retention. Again, it depends on the amount of interdigitation. Diastema of more than 3 mm with distally tipped incisors. So if the incisors are measly tipped, then you refer to the orthodontist because this will need bodily movement and fixed appliances. 
so it's um, a diastema of less than three millimeter, and it is a normal part of a mixed dentition development. Just to reassure and refer the patient um, uh, uh, with no treatment. Just review every six months. Uh, otherwise, if the patient is being bullied, uh, the diastema is really big, the incisors are distally tipped, then you can go for simple tipping movement, you can go for removable appliances. A little thing spring should do it. A patient with a class 2 division 1 increased over jet skeletal class 2, like this patient here, then it is an important timing to go for functional appliances to modify growth. So growth modification usually in the mix starts in the mixed dentition, and you need to identify the proper cases that will need simple functional appliances, not other complicated features associated with this. If there are other uh, features, then you need to refer to the orthodontist. So simple functional appliance, twin block for nine months, review teeth eruption, and that's it. This is the patient after treatment. Right, uh, class 2, division 1 with a skeletal class 1, so increased over jet, not because of the skeletal pattern, but because of dental factors related to proclined and spaced upper labial segment. If this is the case, like here, so we have class 1 everywhere except for the incisors, we have class 2, division 1, a generalized spacing, upper incisors are proclined, over jet is increased. If this is the case, then we can go for symbol removable appliance to retrocline the upper labial segment and close the spaces and reduce the over jet. So we could do this early. We can use labial bow, modified labial, labial bow with, with reverse loop. Robert's retractor could be used as well, not as common, but it could be used as well. So a simple treatment, removable appliance, and of course retention is necessary uh, to avoid reopening of spaces and increase of overjet. Patients with some thumb sucking habit, it's important to identify those patients early, give them proper advice. Uh, Non-physical methods is the first step. You know, just uh, uh, advise them, talk to them, show them cases, encourage them, educate the, the kid and the parents. And this should last three to six months. If it doesn't work, then you need to go for a proper active treatment like the habit breaker appliance that looks like this. Um, and then uh, again, you need to use this six to 12 months. Uh, but the patient should be on board. You know, the kid should be willing to stop the thumb sucking habit. You cannot go with an active treatment when the patient is actually not complying. It, it will not work. Um, most of the features related to a thumb sucking habit usually reversible, except for the narrow maxilla and unilateral cross bite. So you might, after uh, the patient stops the um, habit you might reassess the malocclusion and go for removal appliance to expand uh, with a midline expansion screw to expand the the, the maxilla for example uh, retained or early loss of deciduous teeth again problems in the mixed condition he counts six months when one tooth is lost the other should be lost uh, on the other side if not then you not you might go for further investigation you can take radiographs in addition to the clinical examination uh, because if this tooth stays longer than its uh, time, then it might cause ectopic eruption or sometimes impaction. Early loss for the incisors, um, you need to document this incidence, make sure to know what the etiology is, if trauma, inform the, par the parents, always document these cases because you might end up in the future with a delayed eruption of the successors because of dilacerbation, displacement of the follicle, uh, loss of space, etc., etc. If the canine was lost on one side and the arch is crowded, then it's important to go for balancing extraction because you might end up with centerline discrepancy. Uh, first, primary molar, that is the D, it depends on the amount of uh, crowding, it depends on the uh, occlusion, intercuspation. Uh, and again, it might affect center line, it might affect posterior segment uh, space condition. So you need to keep the patient under observation and carry out necessary treatments like space maintainers if necessary. Um, an E, 
An early loss of E, again, it depends on the amount of bond left above D5. It depends on the space condition of the arches. Um, any crowding, uh, it could end up with the 6 uh, uh, tipping mesially, taking the space of the 5 and causing possible impaction of the 5. So it is important to go for space maintainer uh, to avoid these problems. Submerged tooth, uh, always keep uh, under observation uh, at the start, let's say uh, up to three months. Uh, if it's not progressing, then keep on uh, observing. Usually it will resolve by itself. If it is progressing, then you need to go for management. Uh, management will depend on if we have the uh, underlying permanent successor or not. Uh, most commonly, this is uh, an E that we're talking about. If it's mild, that means it's above the contact point, then just observe and, and uh, interfere when the five is really coming very close by extracting to allow the five to come through. If the um, if it's uh, moderate, that means it's at the contact point and progressing going below, then this is a risk of losing space by tipping of adjacent teeth, a risk of going under the gingiva and causing a more severe and complicated extraction uh, procedure later on, and it could lead to uh, displacement of the erupting five and impaction. So sometimes it is important to go for extraction and space maintainers to avoid the consequences of no treatment. Uh, if you're in doubt, if the five is missing, it's important to refer to the orthodontist because they might use the space to relieve crowding um, as part of a comprehensive orthodontic treatment. First, permanent molars with poor prognosis, please go back to the guideline. Uh, by the Royal College of Surgeons that was updated in 2016. Um, this is an ex extremely important topic to, to uh, understand. Um, when we say six with poor prognosis, usually it's, uh, this is when you have a six with two surface fillings or if you have a six with hypoplasia uh, or active caries, uh, these are sixes with poor prognosis. Uh, you need to understand balancing extraction and compensating extraction. Uh, you need to know what it means by saying early uh, extraction of the six or ultimate, which is the optimal, the perfect time, uh, and late extraction and the consequences. Uh, again, this is from your interceptive lecture. Uh, just to uh, uh, review what we mean by the optimal timing of extraction, it means that you actually extract it at, at a time when you could um, highly guarantee that the seven will come in its place beautifully with minimal consequences. Uh, this is the time when the patient is about eight to 10 years of age and the bifurcation area of the developing seven is just about starting to calcify on the RPG. The developing follicle of the seven is, a, is uh, overlapping the distal root of the 6 and the angle between the 7 and the 6 is about 15 to 30 degrees. In addition, it's important to identify the presence of a developing follicle of the wisdoms because if you're going to lose the 6, it's really good to have two molars and not to end up with the 7 only. Uh, sometimes, sometimes it's not possible to identify the follicle of the wisdoms uh, uh, for patients in such ages, then you just go on with these three optimal time features and criteria. So, uh, the optimal time is more important and more relevant and demandable than the maxilla, and it's important to uh, refer to the orthodontist for advice if in doubt. Supernumerary teeth, of course, uh, if you uh, identify them, uh, then you need to try to avoid uh, consequences of leaving them because they might lead to associated pathology, displacement of adjacent teeth, crowding, uh, preventing of, of eruption of teeth, impaction uh, of, of the permanent teeth, and so on and so forth. But it's important to identify their position, monitor if, not, if they're not causing any problems, or uh, manage accordingly. The late eruption of, uh, of teeth um, as we said, it's important to go for sequence of eruption rather than the timing of eruption. Uh, bilateral eruption should uh, be about six to nine months uh, difference 
not more. Uh, if it's more, then you go for further uh, diagnosis and uh, management. Sequence of eruption is important, so the sequence uh, is important and the symmetry of eruption is important, but not the actual timing. Okay. Impact is first permanent uh, molars. Um, the management, uh, usually, uh, luckily, uh, most of these cases will resolve spontaneously. So just monitor these patients. Uh, if it does not progress, then you can go for uh, more active treatment like inserting, um, uh, sep separating uh, elastics. Uh, so if it's mild, then you can go for separating elastics or uh, you can actually tie a wire around the contact point between the E and the 6 and try to tie it every two weeks in order to uh, unlock the ectopic uh, 6 and allow its eruption. Uh, if it doesn't work and it is progressing and it's a bit severe like here, then you might sacrifice the E. You can extract the E, allow the 6 to erupt fully, and then later on deal with the uh, mesial tip, deal with loss of space and the possible impaction of the file later. Right, uh, again, if in doubt, please refer. So this is a patient who came because his upper right central is brocklined with overjet increase, but we did identify the lower six being ectopic. It's actually locked under the E. And obviously the patient is old enough that is telling us that this is not gonna go uh, uh, spontaneously uh, correct by itself. So we went with separators uh, for some times and actually it didn't work. So we had to go with a proper attachment on the upper uh, six and another attachment as you could see on the lower six. And we had to run uh, vertical elastics in order to allow this to, to, uh, to be unlocked and, and come uh, properly erupt vertically into its occlusal uh, space, uh, occlusal level. If we have unerupted maxillary incisor, then it's important to go for history of trauma. We might have uh, dilacerations of the roots, we might have supernumerary teeth, we might have um, uh, traumatized uh, gingiva with uh, um, fibrous tissues. Uh, and we need uh, simple uh, management with a simple uh, incision. Uh, if you know the etiology, then it's, uh, it's uh, easy to go for the management. So once you know what's wrong, then you can go for the management. The Royal College of Surgeons of England have guidelines. Please review this. Again, this is part of your interceptive lecture. Uh, this is the proper time uh, and the proper management of the patient based on the age and based on the level of development of the incisor. So these are the cases related to the general dental practitioner uh, that he could or she could treat uh, early or refer, as we said, depending on the case.